Well, good morning. So today we're going to look at the opposite of that today for part of it. And we're going to look at this idea of who's running your life. Because here's the number one deterrent to you letting God run your life. You ready? I'm just one word. Selfishness. We, we just tend to be self-centered. We tend to care more about ourselves than others, and we become arrogant. And, and James, in chapter 4, is talking about all these things. By the way, just two side notes. Number one is, next week we will celebrate graduates, which right now is graduate. So I'm excited I'll get to celebrate graduate. But if you have some graduates you want to let us know about, that's fine. Otherwise, we will celebrate graduate next weekend. So that'll be a first. I've never done that before. Just, you know, the birthing order. I'm not sure what happened there. But anyway, it just happens. Now here's the oh, second thing. It's the first time I've had coffee up here in over a year, so it's great to see you. <laughs> Carl, I'm so excited. It's, I have to look this way and just say Carl. I can, I can just, Carl's. This is delicious. It's, uh, I think it's hazelnut, though. It's a little different, a little different coffee. Is this hazelnut? coffee. I just taste hazelnut because I'm weird. That's all good. So here's the series verse, James 2, 26. As the body with the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And so I'm going to have you answer a question today for you. Why should I let God run my life? So if you've been a Christian for years, the truth is there are times, if you're not careful, that you allow other things to take over. If you're not a Christian, today's question might help you to understand how much greater it is to follow God and what happens when you don't. Now, here's what I know. Well, let me give you this illustration first. When I was a kid, my dad, I'll never forget, one summer, um, we had to work with my dad every summer from the time we were about, it was probably eight years old, honestly. We probably go to, my parents probably go to jail now. But uh, my mom's probably watching. Mom, don't worry, we will not prosecute you at 87. <laughs> But, uh, but when we were kids, uh, we would go to work with Dad, and, and uh, in our junior high, about junior high time, uh, I remember one job very specifically. We were in Homestead. It was probably, Homestead was much hotter than Miami itself. There was no movement of wind. There's about an inch of topsoil, and then it's just rock, coquina rock from there on. And, but the rules back then were you had to dig into the coquina rock 12 inches for a foundation, so I can remember my dad putting us on this one job. We had pickaxes and shovels. And my brother and I, all morning, were working as hard as we could. And we probably got three or four feet of footer each out of about 150 foot of footer at least. And so my dad shows, uh, shows up, comes over and says, uh, hey, what have you guys been doing? Slacking off? We're like, no, we're working as hard as we can. He goes, give me that. And he takes the pickaxe. He starts picking at it, does it about three or four times. And he goes, huh. And walks away. So we're like, okay. So we just kept working because we, you know, we didn't want the beatings to begin. And so, um, I wish I was kidding. I would, anyway. Uh, but anyway, so, and of course it had to be square, by the way, square shovels because the footer had to be square, ready for a block. And uh, a few minutes later, I don't know how long later, it was just hotter and hotter. A few minutes later, all of a sudden this guy with a truck uh, and a trailer shows up and he's got this product on the back, this, this thing that looks amazing that I've never seen before, and he drives over to the ditch where it's marked out, and he puts this thing, and it's, I found out later it's called a ditch witch, and in about 15 minutes, he did the rest, and my brother and I were like, why have we been doing this, and of course my dad said, because I'm teaching you discipline, or whatever he said. And I remember we thought we could never compete with that. It, it would never be such a thing. And here's the illustration I want to use for you today. Okay, When we look at selfishness and self-centeredness, it would be like if we went to the Grand Canyon in Arizona, overlooking the Colorado River, seeing that huge, vast beauty. But as we walk up on it, instead of looking in the Grand Canyon, we take our shovel, we turn around, we dig it, and then we say, look at what I've done. It's so amazing. And that's what most people on earth are doing. And even some Christians. We go from looking and seeing how awesome and what God can do with our lives is the Grand 
canyon. And when we try to take over and we try to do things in our flesh and then we brag about it, the angels from heaven have to just go, you know. So here's what I wanted to tell you today. Two things as we talk about this. You need to understand. By the way, it's Pentecost Sunday. We talk about the Holy Spirit coming on believers at Pentecost. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you a couple things. Number one is this. Listen, you and I need to be very aware that there are real spiritual battles going on all the time. I know that we deal with physical difficulties. I know that we deal with emotional difficulties. But in the middle of that, sometimes we forget there's a spiritual battle. So I want you to hear me carefully. If you're a Christian, we know that the enemy can't possess you. It's not like that movie where the girl's head spins around, right? But we know that he can harass you, okay? And, And here's the two different things, though, that you need to understand about spiritual warfare. One type of spiritual warfare is from without, It's it's when the enemy attacks you, when all of a sudden you're thinking good things and all of a sudden good things, bad things start to flow towards you and you're like, where did that come from? I can tell you where that came from. But then there's a second one, the battle from within. Because when you became a Christian, the Bible says that all things became new and that's wonderful, except that your habits, your old ways of thinking love to hang on. And those old habits love to come out. And you don't have to teach somebody about bad habits. You ever notice that bad habits are easy? I mean, I can quit exercising. It doesn't bother me a bit. I just don't get up, right? I, you know, I get up really early to exercise. You know how, how, how much work it takes for me not to do spiritual discipline? Same amount. Just don't have a quiet time. Don't spend time in the Bible. And before you know it, I hadn't even thought about it, right? Exercise, same way. Food, the opposite of that. If you were to give up any food today, I mean, if you said on the way home, I am not going to eat Girl Scout cookies, I'm telling you, Girl Scouts will show up at your door and give away free cookies, right? But the real battle is within. What are you going to do with that? Some of you struggle with salty foods. Some of you struggle with sweet foods. And here's the deal. Some of you will struggle with spiritual internal battles that other people won't struggle with. Some of you will struggle with the ways you think because of the ways you grew up, what somebody said to you, how you felt about yourself, your childhood, all that stuff plays into it. But here's the real battle. It's really easy. Will you choose love or will you choose selfishness? Will you choose to say, God, I want to do what you want me to do or I'm better than that. I don't need that. And in a world full of selfish and self-centered people, I want to tell you that you can make a huge difference when you love others. Because when you're selfish, your prideful words, your prideful thoughts, our selfish thoughts, they hurt other people. It's not just you affected. But when we humble ourselves before God, what happens? He creates the grand canyon of beauty in our lives. He makes something that we could never make. He blesses our families in ways they never could be blessed. He uses us in the middle of difficulty and gives us the strength to walk through the hardest things. So James is looking at the very early church, not many years after Jesus was gone. Listen, this chapter is closer than we are to 80s music, to Jesus rising from the dead. Jesus rising from the dead was closer to the date this was written than we are to when shot through the heart was written. You gave love a bad name. So let's talk about a few things. Number one, when desires rule, you hurt others. One of my favorite posts this week was from one of my former students. And so it's always great because I taught junior high. So one of the great things is to see these junior hires now dealing with elementary and junior high kids. And I just laugh. I just, oh, I remember when you were that age. It's that old man. Kind of, I remember when you were that age. That's how I feel. By the way, the friends that they're getting ready to have the reunion, same age as the Golden Girls. That'll freak you out. All right, so... So, so, this, so this mom posts that her kids hate her and told her she was terrible. Here's why. She made them go to school. Now, 
We all know that moms need to make their kids, dads need to make their kids go to school, right? When it's time to go to school, you got to go to school. Why? Because you can't let kids let their desires run them. You've got to teach them not to do that. And so James, early in the church, Jesus' uh, uh, earthly brother, says this to the early church. What causes fights and quarrels among you? I love the word quarrels because it sounds like squirrels. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Come on, you got some desires that battle with you. Some of you, if I brought ice cream to your house, there'd be a battle. Some of you, if it was potato chips, there'd be a battle. For some of you, it's fishing equipment, right? Or hunting equipment, whatever it is, right? There's a battle going within you. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. We're thinking most likely this is a metaphor, but who knows? Then it continues. You covet, but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have why, because you don't ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive, because you ask with wrong motives. Why? That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, I'll come back to that in a minute. Don't you know? This is, by the way, a wake up like, didn't you know? Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or hatred towards God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, let me give you one thing. I hope you'll hang on to this the rest of your life. There is nothing wrong with emotions. You will have emotions. You'll be driving, somebody will cut you off. It's even natural to feel angry when somebody cuts you off in traffic because that's a self-defense mechanism to wake you up to keep you from dying, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Now, if you then say something you shouldn't say, give it digital reflection, (laughs) swerve into the car, try passive-aggressive tailgating, right? Or aggressive, aggressive tailgating, right? Then you've allowed sin to be your engineer. You've allowed your emotions to run you. Emotions should be the caboose. They're going to be there. They're going to be part of your life, but you should not make decisions based on on emotions. And the last time you made a purchase in a hurry, you learned that lesson. Especially if you bought something big on emotion, right? You said, oh, I shouldn't have let it run me. So so listen, I want to encourage you, be aware of this battle that you're fighting to let your emotions run your life. Be aware. This is one of the battles. This is the inside battle. So what do you do? Inside, check your thoughts. Why did that person cut me off make me so mad? Because they're an idiot. No, that's not a good answer, okay? Because they don't know how to drive. No. You know why it made you mad? Because you're trying self-protection. Something in you told you they did that on purpose. By the way, my wife continually tells me most people don't do it on purpose. And then I say, but that person did. I learned that from my dad, right? Because my dad always said, they're trying to kill me. Now, I grew up in Miami. The truth was, they were trying to kill us. But that's a whole different story. So check your thoughts. And then check your attitude, because typically we're prideful. How many of you have ever had to do the I'm sorry wave while driving? I was at a light one night. Turn arrow turned green. My brain said, that's the straight arrow. I went straight. Somebody was turning left. I almost hit them. I have no idea how I avoided them. And as I avoided them, I'm sure they were saying all kind of words to which I just did the sorry wave. But when somebody cuts us off, we've never made a mistake, right? You see how pride makes us push other people down, think we're better, hurt other people. And then we need to ask God for love. So I gave you four things there. You probably didn't hear them. Be aware of the battle. Check your thoughts. Check your attitudes, especially pride. And then ask God to help you to be loving. See, that's that fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, all those things. You know, one of the favorite things that happened this morning, somebody came up to me, one of our team leaders came up to me and said, hey, so-and-so volunteered, uh, uh, we call them servants, but we'll say volunteers, so-and-so volunteered to help. And I went, really? 
That's awesome. They've never, I, I don't know that they've ever helped with anything. That's phenomenal. You know why it blows me away as a pastor? Because anytime somebody steps out and says, I'm going to help, it shows that they have put their selfishness on the back they put their emotions on the back and said, what can I do, God, to do what you want me to do? Because when you help, there is suffering. Did I just say that out loud? It's true. When you help with people, guess what? Some people go, I don't like that. But guess what? You put the emotions in the back and you say, God, what do you want me to do? And you're faithful in what he wants you to do. Number two, humble confession brings renewal. James continues, or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? Now remember, he talked about jealousy earlier. It's the idea of cheating on God. Theologians struggle with this. I don't struggle with it. I totally get it. God doesn't want you to cheat on him. It's very easy. And then it continues. I love this. He jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us. Now listen to this. But... He gives us more grace, which means even when you blow it, even when you mess up, even when you fail, even when you falter, even when you allow your tongue to run wild, even when you allow your mind to run wild, even when you allow your emotions to run you, he gives more grace. And then it continues. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. That's back from Proverbs 3. Then he says, Submit yourselves then to God. We know what submit means. In this case, it's the opposite of opposing God. It's basically saying, whatever you want, God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What does that mean? It means there's going to be attacks from outside too. You have to resist them. Those, those things that come, those, things that, those thoughts that attack you. You're never going to make it through this. When, by the way, when God convicts you, it's specific. When the enemy condemns you, it's general. So God will say, you need to apologize to so-and-so, and, -so, and you'll, you'll sense that in your spirit. You need to make something right. The enemy will come to you and go, you're a terrible dad, you're a terrible pastor. Well, probably won't tell you you're a terrible pastor. Maybe, maybe. You're a terrible mom, you're a terrible this, you're a terrible that, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's an enemy attack. You need to pay attention to it. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. Remember, if God's far, he didn't move right? Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. This refers to the Old Testament when they would go into the temple and one of, after they did sacrifice, what did they do? They looked in the, the, the copper wash basin. One of the only times they got to see their faces and they'd wash their hands. Cleansed from sin. That's what this is talking about. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to glo glo gloom. And then it says this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. These passages are basically saying, you and I need to recognize the sin, the failure, the pride, the arrogance, the times that we think we're a little better than other people in our lives, and be honest with God around it. Listen, Satan uses pride to divide. Always. He uses pride to divide. And anytime you and I think we're better than somebody else, oh, I wear a mask, so I'm better than them. Oh, I don't wear a mask, so I'm better than them. Oh, I was vaccinated, so I'm better than them. Oh, I wasn't vaccinated, so I'm better than That should never be in the church. If you hear a church bragging about either of those things, you need to look at that church and go, arrogance has happened in that church because they think they're better because they do this or don't do this. Beware when they a church or a religious leader stands on anything that's not straight from God's word. Why? Because fear, anger, and pride all go hand in hand. It's what cult leaders use to motivate people. So even in the church, be careful. If you see that in me, feel free to give me a call. Oh, Eric, I, last week I saw. And I'm like, yeah, I saw you too. We were driving right next to each other. <laughs> Beware of pride and anger and fear. Number three, slander and pride bring self-judgment. And I did this from Amplified, because what the Amplified Bible does is it takes all the Greek and gives you all the meanings, because Greek is a very broad language. So here we go. Believers, do not speak against or slander one another. He who speaks self-righteously against a brother or judges his brother hypocritically speaks against the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer, but a judge of it. The only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy, the one God 
has the absolute power of life and death. But who are you to hypocritically or self-righteously pass judgment on your neighbor? Now, you need to understand this word slander because every once in a while somebody will say, well, Eric, we're not to judge each other. Well, obviously, James is, right? He doesn't sound like he's passing judgment on someone. Well, what is this? There's a big difference between discernment and slander. Slander is when you go out of your way to speak evil or malicious, even false words intended to hurt somebody. It's when you go out of your way to use something to hurt somebody. There's an old Jewish story about a guy who was gossiping in a community and somebody went to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, we need your help. This guy is ruining my business because he's telling lies about my business. And the rabbi said, I'll take care of it. And he went and met with the man. He said, have you been gossiping? And immediately the man's face fell. And he realized, yes. And what I've been saying is wrong. How can I fix it, rabbi? And the rabbi said, no problem. Come back tomorrow, bring a pillow. The guy was like, what? He said, yep, come back tomorrow and bring a pillow. So the guy came back the next day with a pillow. And the rabbi said, I want you to cut it open. And that feather pillow, I want you to go to each house, each business, where you shared that lie, that slander, and I want you to leave a feather in front of the business. And so this guy went place to place all around town, leaving feathers everywhere, leaving feathers everywhere. And then he went back to the priest and goes, okay, so now what do I do to make it right? And the priest said, go, the rabbi said, go collect all the feathers. The guy said, I can't do that. And he said, neither can you take back slander. You can repent. You can apologize. But the things we say that are intended to hurt other people cannot be put back in the box. Be very careful when you act as judge, jury, prosecutor. Discernment is one thing. Listen, you need to be discerning. There are times you need to warn people about other people. Watch out. Okay, I mean, if a contractor rips you off, don't say, uh, uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think I should have to pay you for work you didn't do. Are you judging me? No, but I'm not a dummy either, right? So, so slander is speaking ill of them. It's something that's not true. It's going out of your way to hurt somebody. It has to do with your heart. And then finally, number four, humbly God-led is the best life. When we humble ourselves and we let God lead, that's the best life. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. And as it is, you boast in your arrogant scheme. See, here's that pride again. All such boasting is evil. If anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, for them it's sin. You know what he's saying there? You're going out and you're going, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And you're talking about living in your own power, getting your own glory. And God says, you don't even know how long you have. Every moment of your life is precious. Instead of trying to dig it yourself in your own flesh, hey, why don't you let God roll in the big equipment? Father, I need your spirit. The only way I can make a grand canyon of love in people's lives and show other people the majesty of how awesome you are is not by digging it myself and trying to, I'm just going to overcome. God, I need you. In my best flesh, I'm selfish and self-centered. Even if I do something good, I'm looking for some kind of reward from it. As soon as somebody complains, I quit. God, as I serve you, I see the grand canyon of your love for me and for other people, and that then flows out naturally. Have you allowed pride to sneak in? Have you allowed judgment, malicious talk to sneak in? Ask God to forgive you. He says he gives more grace. So when you blow it and you mess up, guess what? More grace. If you left some feathers here and there, guess what? More grace. God, I need your grace. And allow him to do that. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or you're watching online, you can give your life to him today. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It means you can never earn your way to God. So what do you have to do? You have to surrender to Jesus who died for you and rose again. Why? To pay for your sin. He went and paid the judge full price. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you the rest of my life. I confess my sin. I turn from it and I surrender my life to you. The Bible says that when you do that, you know about his death and resurrection, that when you do that, 
you start a new life with the Holy Spirit power inside of you to do things you would never be able to do on your own. Instead of saying, look at what I've done, you're able to say, look at what God's done through me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. Lord, thank you for James. Thank you that somebody who at first didn't even know who you were found their way home to you and then was a great witness not only to the early church but to us today. Lord, in the early church there was fighting and selfishness and all kind of things that were said and done and yet they turned back to you. I pray we would do that too. Not just today, but in the moments. Those times that we fail, those times that we falter, those times the enemy attacks us without and within that, Father, we through your spirit would overcome. Thank you that we have the mind of Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen.